not too good here. We just had one go clear up. Yeah, I know. As you can see, around here back, I think it's defensible, uh, even with just hand tools. Like I said, we got two hand crews here right now. We finally run out of either water or power here. Lost a home right above you there. You can see the black smoke. This is what's going on, man. Fire is a force of nature, but so is a tight community of family and friends. At 1.24 p.m. on September 12, 2015, the two met face to face on Cobb Mountain in Lake County, California. The Valley Fire was bearing down on the Prather Homestead, some 650 acres, including houses, a communications facility, and prime timberland. The family reacted with speed and determination. But the story of what made this possible goes back more than 150 years. My great-grandfather came to Lake County, as far as I know, in 1864. In 1888, Adam Springs was a small little resort under receivership, and he found out it was for sale, and so there was 720 acres with it small hotel and a couple of buildings. The guests stayed a long time. They came by stagecoach and most of them would stay for the summer. Fire was always a danger, it still is. And so it was a normal practice that all the people, all the resort owners, everyone around, there wasn't that many people around, but after a couple of rains and then dried enough to burn, they would set the mountains on fire and let it burn as little low intensity fires because they did it every year. Over the years, the family trained and passed their knowledge down across the generations, and it paid off. When my grandpa's new hotel burned in 1943, it was a three-story hotel, and it was surrounded by woods, and yet it never set any fires because of the control burning. They used to burn out Big Canyon and all around the resort. Fire prevention and firefighting was in the family blood, but nothing would prepare the Prathers for the Valley Fire, which consumed more than 76,000 acres, killed four people, and destroyed nearly 2,000 structures. I never heard my grandparents talk about a fire of that size. I never talked about, heard anyone talk about a fire like that. When the fire struck, the family sprang into action. They searched out whatever equipment they could find and alerted the neighbors. Their first thought was to protect the nearby community of Loch Lomond. We had our hands full when the Valley Fire was burning. In the initial burning period, uh, the fire started on a Saturday, right around noon, one o'clock, something like that. I saw it from the back porch of my house. Mike got a call from his son, Chris, and said that the fire is only right down at the base of our mountain. If we get somebody up there, we can do something with it ourselves and try to stop it before it burns up our mountain. Family members and friends slipped the roadblocks to bring in supplies. There was eight of us that night. We worked for from one o'clock Sunday afternoon until almost 11 o'clock in the morning, Monday morning, by ourselves, and we put in almost three miles of fire line and held it. Fire burnt a whole bunch of houses right through this subdivision, right under us, and I guess jumped that trail and they fought it up here. The air tankers were dropping like crazy and we thought that for sure they would flank it and take care of it, but the wind was so strong pushing it towards Cobb Valley and, and had an angle towards uh, Hoburg's. But our line did held. Every spot fire that did cross our line we picked up. Finally, late afternoon Monday, CDF finally got some stuff up here to help us out, uh, starting with a couple of dozers. We can't always be successful from stopping them from torching in every tree, but by eliminating the fuels and opening the road and back burning and then holding our back burn with our little water we had in our trucks and just putting out the back edge and let the fire, the main fire, pull our little fire towards itself, it was successful. We wanted to find out where we needed to be doing the most good at the time. So we, we found the fire here and uh, we decided we'd have to back burn from this next road up because it already crossed this road we're on. And you look at it, it's just total devastation below compared to the road up above that we back burned through and it just back burned through like a, a large control burn mm -hmm. and it stopped the fire from, from continuing up the hill. 
Daryl had his D4 dozer down here, getting a ring around the houses and, and whatever. We uh, would like to use the cat to clean some of the trails that needed cleaned off better. But uh, on the trucks, we would run one truck to get water while the other truck was fighting the fire. And then when that truck would get back, the other truck would go get water. We had an S10 with a water tank. We had Danny's pickup with a little water tank. All of them had little pumps on it. This truck, along with our little S10 pickup with 175 gallons and a similar type Honda pump, that was what we were using to hold an, our backfiring operation when we backfired uh, from our logging road. We protected this logging road. We got our fire trucks, our, our uh, little pumper trucks, and uh, my brother's water wagon, and we um, made a plan to hold the fire on our logging road, okay. which is in fact what we did. There was one point when we were on the steepest part of the, the land up here and I could see the main fire coming and I could see our burn behind us in the distance glowing and not knowing what was out ahead of us. I, I felt the hair stand up on the back of my head and I said, you know what, if this is a bad place to be. If it crossed our line, we'd be trapped. We couldn't get out either way. But we were able to hold it with three miles of, of our own line on Sunday night and then the next day we got reinforcements with family and friends and everybody else that showed up and we were able to hold it. We just kind of got lucky and at the same time we, we combined our luck with a lot of skill and knowing what we were doing. You have to be prepared ahead in that country. I mean we had built the trails, we had the little fire trucks, and we had the experience. While the Prathers stood their ground and fought the flames, most on Cobb Mountain simply ran for their lives. My name is David Leonard, I'm the principal of Cobb Mountain Elementary School. The day of the Valley Fire was uh, also the day of our 30th anniversary celebration of Cobb Elementary School. And very quickly, things started to change. Helicopter sounds and airplanes started buzzing overhead and around, and you could just really, I mean, my heart was racing. When I read that Highway 175 and Bottle Rock Road were being evacuated, it was immediately apparent that I needed to pack up and go. I grabbed all of our photo albums, grabbed pictures off the wall, grabbed our files, a backup of my hard drive, and started loading my pickup truck. A spotter plane buzzed my house lower than I've ever seen any flying vehicle. And we see the helicopter a lot, and I thought, I gotta get out of here. As I drove out to Highway 175, I looked up the road this way and you could just see the entire sky was filled with clouds. It's one thing to get out. It's another to come back, survey the damage, and try to make sense of it all. My name is Marcus Maria Jung. I'm a sculptor. I have been working on Cobb Mountain since 2010. I have experienced, of course, the Valley Fire, I have experienced loss, I lost my art studio. I was in Los Angeles at the time, I was preparing for um, exhibitions down there. So we were feeling really helpless. After two days, I drove up and tried to be as close as possible to the area. So I was prepared coming up, but nothing really prepares you once you're driving up, once you're coming up. It's hard to see it, of course, in this state now. It's very different from like it used to be. Strangely, there's always a element of a complete liberation at the same time, because it is not in between. It's not that there's, you know, what could I save? It is gone. But seeing it was very, very um, tough to take. Well, this is where our home used to be, right here. We had a three-bedroom house, about, I think, 15, 1,600 square feet. It was a one-story house, but um, there was a half basement, and so we had a deck going around three sides of the home, so you really kind of felt up and elevated in the woods. All around us, we had 80 trees taken out because they were just destroyed by the fire. We moved six times since the Valley Fire started and ultimately landed back on our property, which is where we always wanted to be. A lot of the summer has been landscaping as well as 
just dragging a lot of limbs to the bottom of our property for chipping. Over the summer we had our daughter's playhouse created, which is, has always been a dream. We had, we had a little tiny plastic playhouse for her a long time ago that melted down to the ground to a tiny pool of liquid plastic. And uh, now she's got a zip line and a deck and a climbing wall and it's just really great. So that was part of the summer. We also have our chicken coop uh, with three chickens. We lost our chickens in the fire and so it's really nice to have fresh eggs. Just started getting them uh, last week. We have our garden perimeter fence built and we've been creating this wood chip path. We're just still getting accustomed to the sunlight but it's a, it's a major adjustment, it's a lot hotter, so trying to find a way to make this place home in a new way. Eleven months after the Valley Fire, just as Lake County was getting back on its feet, tragedy struck again. On August 13, 2016, an arsonist set fire to a patch of land just south of Lower Lake, triggering a blaze known as the Clayton Fire. My name is Willie Cepeda. I uh, work for Lake County Fire. Um, fire chief, been with the department for 30 years. It was Armageddon. There wasn't any way to control uh, or contain that fire. It was evacuate, uh, stand on, on uh, structure defense, and um, you know do your best to save each house you came to. The fire started Saturday at um, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The uh, fire had a lot of potential. One of my battalion chiefs set up the initial command. It was about 100 foot by 100 foot, strong winds, and uh, it was uh, a rapid rate of spread. The fire started off of Clayton Road, which is right off of uh, Highway 29. That, that day had a lot of probability for strong fire behavior. It was warm. It was uh, relatively low uh, humidity. And uh, as the winds increased that early part of the morning, it was pretty much um, off and, and uh, well established. The uh, initial aircraft estimated about 50 homes involved and what seemed to be uh, a matter of minutes was that they estimated uh, with what they could see through the smoke columns about 100 homes involved. In the end, 300 structures were destroyed, 28 were damaged. More than 3,900 acres were burned and a new reality began to take hope. All you'll see on this mountain, except for a couple of little draws, is just nothing but toothpicks. Yeah, there's, there's sections that were spared, but not many. You know, we've burned in the last five years about 30 to 35 percent of our county land mass, which is about 1,256 square miles. They've got green grass uh, coming up now, but all the trees are either gone or what's left is scorched. We used to look at fire season being about three and a half, four months, and we're gonna have to be um, prepared year round for those wildland fires. Fires in the last 10 to 20 years have gotten significantly larger. The fuel load is greater than it's ever been. Wherever there's brush that hasn't burned in 25 or 30 years, that's, that's gonna be a potential problem. People say, well, God, what's left to burn? Well, there's a huge amount left to burn. We have Canocti and the Riviera is, a, is certainly a potential. Well, what I did see is after the Rocky, the Valley, the Clayton, the Patterson, the Elk, uh, the dam fire, that um, when we uh, initiated evacuation, people evacuated. This whole area here was evacuated. We'd already done all this stuff up here the night before. If you look at the Schoolhouse Museum, they had a defensible space, and, and that structure was, of course, uh, saved. Months, even years after the Lake County fires, the forest tells its story of wind and flame. One burn indicator is the scarring mark and the burn pattern, how it uh, follows the a tree pattern. As a fire moves this direction, it, it comes in and it wraps itself up and around as it goes through, and you see that on all these trees. The other indicator is what we call leaf or needle freeze, and on some of these that are scarred, the needles and the leaves will bend towards the direction that the fire traveled. 
Fire after fire, year after year, the stress is taking its toll on the communities involved. The emotional stress on firefighters is, is something that people don't think about it, but they take it personally when, when a house burns or property is lost. Losing even one home is, is kind of like um, being a paramedic and losing a patient. Those lives are changed forever. This one really, uh, you know, hit home. We, we know the faces that go with those homes. You know, the guy's tools, that that's his livelihood, or the kid's toys, that's their safe haven. As the fire chief, you uh, instill in me to protect your, your life and your property. And um, for all of us there, we, you know, have a lot of heartfelt uh, sorrow that we weren't able to achieve that. As winter green reveals itself across the fire-scorched hills, there are other signs of hope in the communities below. My name is Kevin Cox. I'm the CEO and founder of the Hope Crisis Response Network. Uh, Hope City is the name that we give our projects when we move into an area because it's not about Hope Crisis Response Network. It's about the families that we serve. Using volunteers from all across the nation and donations from local individuals, organizations, and businesses, Hope City plans to build at least 100 homes for victims of the Valley and Clayton fires. Uh, this house here is a 960 square foot home and uh, also has uh, about seven, 73 square foot of porch and deck. It's very small. This is a very manageable, very high efficiency home. When we enter into this collaboration and this partnership, we all become Hope City. On September the 14th, we received probably a half a dozen phone calls from pastors in the area asking us to come and serve and to help. There was about 1,300 homes that were lost, I believe it was 1,381, and of that we identified the potential of 450 homeowners that would qualify for our assistance. We focus all of our attention on relationships. It's the relationships with others, it's relationships with the volunteers, which then in turn helps the, volu the, the volunteers to connect with the homeowners. It's about the volunteer and, and the heart to come to want to serve, and it's our responsibility to equip them to be able to serve in that community. What we're doing is rebuilding a uh, um, from the same pad where the previous house was, which was a two-story structure, and we're putting in a ranch house here. This will be laundry room and water heater, bathroom. This is our second winter living in the RV, so if you get a little tired. <laughs> Once this is done, it'll be wonderful. So this was all forested, uh, and you couldn't see the neighbor's home. You didn't know who lived around here. And now, uh, of course, now we've met some people that we that were living here with us uh, and we never met. It was the challenge, and it was the will to, to survive and, and not be defeated by a fire someone else created. You know, it's like I wasn't going to surrender. I wasn't ready to. We've helped over 20,000 families get back home over the years. To be able to, to watch a family go through the journey, to watch the family go through the, the emotional uh, impact, and we weep tears of sorrow with the families when we start. And then as we're able to hand the keys off to their new home, we're, we're weeping tears of joy. This is a marathon, not a sprint. This is a long-term recovery and uh, we want to be able to be prepared to meet those needs for these families in the future as well. What to make of it all? Trauma, shock, and sorrow, of course. There's a voice on the wind Saying everything's gonna change But in the communities touched by the fires, there's mostly a sense of gratitude. Oh, we're totally grateful that we still have a mountain here. Very grateful we were able to do what we could to save ourselves, not only our own property, but the properties of other people as well, and the towers and everything else that goes with it. Grateful for all the friends and, and family members that don't live up here, that, were, that got here as soon as they could to, to give us the support we had. It, it was a combined effort, and uh, if they hadn't been there, the whole the mountain would have burned. It was a worry, I mean, yes. I mean, it's, it's probably etched in their mind forever. 
here is the the plaque for the tree farmer of the year. <laughs> The people in this, count, in this county and our community have come together in ways that I really didn't expect. Art is a medium where people can meet and have conversations about what happened. My art has um, grown from there, I would say. It has even been more an affirmation to do what I do and to be a, a messenger for nature and trees. I think my loss of my home really allowed me to relate to these kids on a level that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to, and, and to the teachers. And we got through it together. I've never worked so hard, I've never been more distressed, been more upset, sad, depressed. But the strength of the kids and the strength of the staff and our support of each other was tremendous. When I go to work, that's the best part is seeing these kids learning and happy even though there is this remnant of the destruction of the Valley Fire. There's a lot more power in the positive and, and that's what we try to see every day. There's